Church, there is a uh, strange new trend out there among college-age students. And I'm not blaming college-age students for this. You're going you're gonna to enjoy this. I think it's simply called aimlessness. There's this thing called aimlessness that's going on out there. It's not that this age group, this particular age group is aimless. I'm not throwing that on you guys. Don't worry. Uh, but that many are learning in colleges and in universities that aimlessness is an important part of life. Uh, this aimlessness movement isn't necessarily about avoiding goals, but it's about allowing yourself to wander and allowing yourself to meander and to be without clear intention for at least a period of your life, if not most of your life. And oddly enough, people are really liking this. Uh, I was reading up on it a couple of weeks ago. Uh, the university, or Columbia University, uh, ha- they're putting out this book called Aimless by Tom Lutz. They're, they're passing it out to some of their students in one of the classes, and he suggests that the best free thinkers in the world, and some of the best religious leaders, and some of the best philosophers, and even some of the best conquerors of all of history uh, were actually quite aimless and even taught aimlessness um, as a virtue. And there's a student from Brown University who wrote this article for the Brown Daily Herald about the importance of aimlessness. And she says that when someone embraces this as a virtue, this aimlessness, they free themselves from any expectation and then, of course, from any consequent disappointments. Uh, She even argued that this is a great way for people to gain wisdom. And this student, she's in her last year, she admitted this is her last year uh, of college, and she really just wants to feel better about answering the question, what are you going to do after you graduate, with the words, I don't know. This philosophy of aimlessness really helps her with that. And I have to tell you, I have to tell you, I I almost thought this was a joke, this whole aimlessness thing. The thought of avoiding an intentional life virtue of, of not setting goals and plans does, does not sound to me like, like people would actually buy into it, but they do. And what's interesting is it's being pushed in colleges, which the irony of that is that typically when you go to college, you have some plan in your life, some goal of what you want to, to reach. And yet they're saying, no, aimlessness is the way to go. It's okay if you have no idea what you want to do and you have no plan and, and, uh, and you don't seek to make that plan and just kind of go with the flow. Uh, and the more I looked into it, the more I found that this is it's a real thing. It's a very real thing. And, and it worries me because these are future business owners in this country. These are future politicians, future ministry leaders, future parents. And some of them think that this aimlessness is a virtue. And I will tell you that aimlessness is not a virtue that you will ever find in Scripture. Living an unintentional, wandering life is not something that our Creator would suggest for us. In fact, there are several passages in Scripture that would paint aimlessness and and wandering in a very, very negative way. Human beings were not created by God to be aimless in this life. We are given purpose. As believers, we're given purpose. And as a church, as a church as a whole, we are given purpose. And that's pretty much what I want to talk to you about today is, is, is the purpose of the church. This is my, we'll call it my second week of candidating sermons, um, Thank goodness it's the last one. There will be a vote today. But last week, I thought it would maybe be a good idea to share from behind the pulpit what my aim as a pastor is. My my main pursuit is to declare the whole counsel of God. And there were a few reasons for it. The first reason was that preaching the whole counsel of God leaves me blameless before the judgment seat of Jesus uh, in regard to teaching. Uh, Preaching the whole counsel of God informs the people of the church about God and his will and his character and the type of conduct that he requires of his people. And then the third thing that we mentioned last week was that preaching the whole counsel of God will equip the church to build up the church. And as I was thinking about that, the last one kind of sums up, in a way, the purpose of the church. It's not an exhaustive definition of what the church should be, but, but in, a, in a nutshell, you know, it's, uh, the church should have purpose to build up the church. The people of the church should seek to equip and, and build up the church. Just as believers shouldn't live an aimless life and a pastor shouldn't preach aimlessly from behind the pulpit, the church shouldn't be aimless in ministry. We have purpose. 
We need to have an aim. We need to have a goal. We need to have a mission. We need to have a, a vision and, uh, you know, just a recognition of where we are, who we are, where we want to go, and how we're going to get there, essentially. And one of the things that I shared in my, uh, in my interview with the search committee, and I also shared last week a little bit during our, our Q&A time, uh, is that it's common for churches, it's, it's very common for churches to have the hardware that they need. Essentially, we have uh, th- these doctrinal foundations, the belief statements that we hold to be true. That's the hardware. And we have the software, which is the, the, the practice of ministry. You know, we've got these programs. We've got um, student ministry. We've got Awana. We've got life groups. We've got Sunday school. We've got different ministry teams, you know, missions, discipleship, um, nurture, facilities, worship, uh, outreach. You know, we've got all of these things But the church is commonly missing what is being referred to as the middleware, the thing that connects our our doctrinal beliefs to our practices. It's it's that thing in between, the driving force that we call essentially a theological vision. Churches are missing a theological vision. That's the, the middleware. This is something that leads the church to make good decisions on how we worship, how we disciple, how we evangelize, how we serve, how we engage our culture in each field of ministry that that we're able to work here. Tim Keller says that a theological vision is a vision for what you are going to do with your doctrine in a particular time and in a particular place. It communicates our purpose. It communicates our aim as a body of Christ. It keeps us from being aimless as a church. And the last verse that I used in last week's sermon, I think is a great one to expound on uh, this week to see a little bit more clearly maybe what a biblical framework for a theological vision might look like in the church. And and understand that I'm not seeking to cast vision today. I think vision is a, a massive, massive thing. But I am seeking to teach on an aspect of intentional ministry that should fit into our vision as a church. So the passage that we're looking at today that we're going to learn from is uh, Ephesians chapter 4. And originally I was just going to do 12, but we need 11 and 12 together. This is Paul writing to the Ephesian church, writing his letter to the Ephesian church, and he says this. And he, which he's referring to Jesus, gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry for building up the body of Christ which looks very familiar. I mean, it's, we covered this just briefly last week, just briefly, but if you look at this and break it down, essentially what we see is there's Jesus, who is the head of the church, who has given certain people to the church to equip the members of the church to do the ministry within the church in order to build up the church. There's no question that the church is, is completely in view in this passage right here. And the first part of God's plan of operation in the church, according to this passage, is equipping. God wants biblical equipping by leaders. And this is going to be a little bit of a recap from what we talked about last week, but there's going to be some new information here too. Um, There were a few different offices that are listed here. And he gave apostles and prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers. Those are all offices within the church. And we need to address two of them right off the bat. We have apostles and we have prophets here. Apostles were ones who were commissioned directly by Jesus, who had seen the resurrected Jesus. Um, Prophets in the New Testament is not the same as prophets in the Old Testament, and it's not to be confused with those who have the gift of prophecy. It was an office in the church, and the office of prophet was uh, pretty exclusive to working in the local church, whereas apostles weren't really confined to just one church, but to oversee many churches. And sometimes prophets would speak revelation uh, uh, from God. Other times they would expound that the revelation that had already been given, you know, talking through scripture and teaching scripture. But, but the role of the apostles and the prophets in the New Testament was essentially to lay the foundation of the early church. That's what they're supposed to be doing. That's what they were supposed to do. According to Ephesians 2.20, they were to lay the foundations of the church. And honestly, this is my interpretation of scripture, that job is finished. 
That job has been done. They laid the foundations of the church. There were 12 apostles plus Paul, and, and you had these prophets, and, and they accomplished their mission 2,000 years ago. We're not still building the foundations of the church. It's been done. And so these offices, these two offices, do not exist in the church anymore. I believe that's what biblical evidence points to anyway. And I'm not saying that the gift of prophecy has ceased, but I am saying that those two offices were fulfilled in the New Testament. We see them fulfilled. And so what we have for the rest of the churches that remain throughout history and today and and for the future church is evangelists, shepherds, and teachers. And I will call those two different offices. You have evangelists who... It's someone who explains the gospel to people who do not already believe. And then you have shepherds and teachers, which I think is one office. I think it's, it's pastors or, or elders or overseers. I think the, the word teacher here is likely indicative of the primary function of shepherds in the church. But they're, they basically build on the foundation that has already been laid. That's their job. That's their duty uh, as, as evangelists and, and shepherds and teachers. They pick up the baton, they build on the foundation that the apostles and the prophets have laid. They are people still given to the church. They are not above or beyond the church. They are a part of the church, and they are given to equip the church, to equip the saints. And we talked a little bit last week about what this word equip means. We have two words to define here real quick. We've got equip, which last week we said it means to repair the saints or to perfect them, essentially for the work of ministry so that the body functions correctly, that the church functions well. And then you have saints. The Greek word for saints is agios, which translates to the sacred or or the holy or simply believers. We're not talking Catholic saints, we're talking biblical saints, which is simply believers, people who believe in Jesus Christ. Those are the saints. Those are the saints. And Jesus gives the church leaders to equip them, essentially. Last week we talked a little bit about how uh, you know, the role of pastor is, is that of, of one who equips the church for the work of ministry. And the main way that this happens is the preaching of God's word. That was the big deal last week, is, is that the pastor should always be preaching God's word. The church can be equipped for service by listening and learning and following what God has to say from his word. And the more that the Bible is championed in the church, the more the people of the church value that word. But I think that it would be wise to zoom in on the next section, what the saints or the members of the church are being equipped for, because this passage really isn't about equipping. It's it's about ministry. It's about the people of the church. And what the people of the church need to be equipped for is intentional service. Intentional service. Believers are being trained up to perform the work of ministry. And this, for some reason, is offensive to many. It was offensive back when this letter was originally written to the Ephesian church. Because there were, there were Jews within the first century church, and the Jews' custom was that the priest does all the work of ministry. They don't have to do anything. The priest does all the work of ministry. And so to hear this would be something just very, very foreign to them. And it's still offensive today to many who still say pastors should be doing all the ministry work in the church. But if we look at the text, if we look at what Paul is writing here, he says shepherds are given... Pastors are given to the church to equip the people of the church to do the work of ministry. So as we, you know, echoing the sentiment from last week's message, ministry is the work of all believers, all members in the church. Ministry belongs to all of us. Not just those with special responsibilities and special roles in the church. And it helps, I think, for us to have a better understanding of the word ministry in this context. What does the work of ministry look like? What is ministry? And when we look at the text, we look at the original Greek word, it's diakonias, which simply means service. Ministry is service. The word used for ministry is the same word used for serving, uh, and, and it would be appropriate to say that pastors equip the members of the church for the work of serving, to serve one another. And something that is probably evident, I think it's evident, but, but I still think we have to say it every once in a while, is that no pastor can do everything that the church needs it to do. Something, yeah, I'll just say this, it doesn't matter how 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 passionate they 
matter how devoted they are. It doesn't matter how skilled they are. The work that needs done will always massively exceed a pastor or a group of pastors' abilities and their skill set and their time, essentially. And one of my favorite stories in the Bible tells about some of the pains of the early church and how they fixed the, the, these, these pains. You go to Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 7, and we see the early church is exhibiting these growing pains. They're growing and growing and growing, and this complaint comes up that says basically, hey, our widows are being neglected in the daily distribution. And they, they bring this, this complaint to the apostles and the apostles recognize the complaint is le legitimate. Yes, you're absolutely right. This is a problem. And they want to fix it, but what they have a problem with is, is that the people are requesting that the apostles fill the gap in service. They have a problem with that. So the apostles bring everyone together, and they basically tell them, hey, we can't do it all, and it's not right for us to even try to do it all. They say, we, are, we were appointed to the ministry of the word, and there are loads of people within this gathering that could easily step up and step in and make sure the widows are getting what they need. And so scripture says uh, that the apostles told them, pick out from among you, pick out from among you, the body of believers, seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. And so the people did exactly that. They looked among themselves. They picked out some people to help fulfill this ministry to fill the gap. Seven men were chosen. And guess what? This pleased the people of the church. It worked out well because needs were being met and the church was running more efficiently, more effectively at that point. The work of ministry does not belong solely to church leaders. It does not belong solely to church leaders. Those leading the church do the right thing by encouraging church members to do ministry, to serve each other. My wife sent me a, a, an article this week, and I loved this article. Right off the bat, there was a wonderful quote by uh, How Howard Hendricks. He said, God is not calling the pastor to do the work of 10 men. He's calling the pastor to equip 10 men to do the work that God has called them to do. And if we need more biblical evidence of what this looks like, you know, consider all the one another passages that we see in the New Testament. All the times that Paul writes to all these different churches and uses the term one another. Galatians 5.13 he says, serve one another. Romans 15, 14, he says, instruct one another. 1 Thessalonians 5, 11 says, encourage one another. We have passages that tell us to admonish one another, to love one another, to help one another. And none of these words, none of these are written specifically to the pastors of the church. They're written to the people of the church, the church as a whole. They're written to the members. Over and over again, the emphasis for the New Testament church is for the congregation, the people of the church, to care for and minister to one another. The ministry of the church belongs to the people. The ministry of the church belongs to the people. I like how one author put it. He says, pastors are the supply line, church members are the front line. And like we talked about last week, we, we're all given gifts that we are to use to serve each other. To be a member in the body of Christ is to have a role in the body of Christ, in the church. Peter writes this in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10. He says, as each has received a gift. Not as some have received a gift, but as each believer has received a gift, use it to serve God one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. And these gifts of varied grace uh, can be seen all throughout Paul's letters to the New Testament church. There are tons of different examples of, of gifts, and these are, are, are essentially tools used to make the church function well. These gifts include, you know, there's charismatic gifts such as uh, speaking in tongues and interpreting tongues and, and prophecy. There are these other gifts of teaching and exhorting. Gifts of service is listed, which is fairly vague. Uh, there's another fairly vague one that's just called the gift of helps. The gift of helps, which is about relieving and supporting and, and, and filling in, being a, a helpful hand where you can. There's gifts of leading. There's gifts of administrating. There are, are gifts of giving, gifts of generosity, uh, gifts of faith, gifts of mercy. You know, there are all kinds of gifts out there that each believer 
has been equipped with. Regardless of what you've been given, though, here's one thing that we need to understand, one thing that is vital, that these gifts are to be exercised under the lordship of Jesus for his church. And we can hear that and know that that means there is no such thing as an insignificant gift or an insignificant talent or an insignificant member of the body of Christ. Attention should not be centered on our gifts or our experiences as much as it should be the supremacy of Christ in all things, the one who, who bestows upon us gifts. Putting your gift to use for the work of ministry in the church is a wonderful reflection of Jesus. A wonderful reflection of Jesus. Serving in the church is a picture of the Savior. We have from his very own words in Mark chapter 10, verse 45. He says, for even the Son of Man, and he's talking about himself, the Son of Man, came not to be served, same word as as what we have in Ephesians 12, not to be ministered to, but to serve or to minister. Diokonias is the word. Ultimately, this work of ministry that we're called to do It's the same work of Jesus that we might humble ourselves as Jesus humbled himself so that we might become servants to other believers, servants to other Christians. It's about seeking ways to meet the needs of our brothers and sisters, especially having in mind what we have been equipped with. The work of ministry. The work of ministry refers to the Lord inspiring his people to carry out his plan for his people which in this case, and in the case of our text this morning, is the building up of the church. It is the health of the church. We want the church to have good health. This is the third element in the text related to God's plan for the operation of his people, the operation of his church. And we look at this, the the linear motion of this plan. I love how this looks. Essentially, he's saying biblical equipping by the shepherds of the church will lead to intentional service by the people of the church, which will in turn lead to or result in good health in the church. The building up of the body, the the, the church, is not a statement, by the way, about physical growth. That's not what Paul's talking about. Paul isn't telling the church that that they need to, to, to be equipped for service so that the church may grow physically, that we would take a small church and make it a mega church. But unfortunately, that sentiment does exist in this world today and even exists among many pastors. It's what we call the success syndrome. It's a horrible thing. I had to read this book in college, um, and Cammie and I revisited this book recently and are going to read through it again together. It's by Pastor Kent Hughes and his wife, Barbara Hughes, and it's called Liberating Ministry from the Success Syndrome. And the whole point of the book is to fight back against the notion that says your church is dead or dying unless it is growing in size. It fights back against that notion. Success in ministry, the, the health of the church, the building up the body is way too often tied to who shows up, how many people are filling the seats. It's way too often tied to that. And people will say that the church, when the church grows in numbers, that must mean it's healthy. But when it's shrinking, that must mean that we're dying. But that is not how it works. That's just not how it works. That's not how God works. When Pastor Kent Hughes tells of a story from 1975, when he came home, from a very discouraging week in ministry, sat at his kitchen table, told his wife, Barbara, that the church is in decline and it's all my fault. Uh, I need to leave. I just have to go. And she reminded him, she, I love this story. I think it's an encouraging thing. She says, hey, Noah preached, Noah preached 120 years without a single convert, without a single convert, but he was still where God wanted him to be, doing what God wanted him to be doing. And he goes on to say that most churches will never grow past 100, 150 members, but that doesn't make them unhealthy at all. That doesn't mean that they're unhealthy. There's too much pressure toward physical growth in the church, too much measuring success by numbers. And the thing is, we're not, the church isn't corporate America. We're the body of Christ. It doesn't work that way. The numbers aren't applicable here. I've used this illustration before, but you don't count calories with a ruler right? You don't measure church health or ministry success by numbers either. Some have taken Paul's meaning in in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 12 to be just that, that if the people do the work of ministry, more people will show up to the church. And we can hope that that will happen. We can pray that that will happen. Of course, we would love to grow in size. But that's not the sign of success. That's not the evidence of faithful and fruitful ministry. 
Church health is not measured by numbers. It's measured by edification. Edification. We've got to dive into that word. That's the building up in our passage this morning translates the, the Greek word oikodome to edification, to edify. And it was literally often used to talk about building a house. You know, we talked earlier about how the apostles built a foundation. We build on that foundation. We're building a house. And the term is only ever really used in the New Testament. And even more narrow of a view, it's really ever only used in Paul's letters to the different churches. And so it's difficult to understand exactly what the word edify can mean, but Vine's Expository Dictionary gave me some help this morning. Basically, to edify, to build up, is to promote spiritual growth and development of character of believers by teaching or by example and service, suggesting such spiritual progress as the result of patient labor. It's a part of our mission statement, you know. If you open up your bulletin to this very first page, right up here, right up here, this is our mission statement. Grandview exists for the sole purpose of glorifying God through Christ. We strive to fulfill our purpose through evangelizing the community, edifying his people, and exalting God. We put that in the bulletin every week so we don't forget it. It's an important thing. And it's not just about encouragement. Edifying isn't just about encouraging people. It's not, that's, that's not a good definition of it. It's about basically any activity that results in the people of the church being more Christ-like. It's about being a community of believers serving each other for the purpose of growing a mature church. The term that Paul uses has an inside these walls meaning. The church is being built up internally as believers are nurtured to fruitful service. This is part of why we all come together on Sunday mornings. I mean, most certainly we come here to exalt God. I think that is the most important thing that we do, but we should also show up to worship services or to Sunday school or to life groups or anything that you can for edification. One, for you to edify others and for you to be edified, for you to be built up and for you to build up others as well as be equipped. The building up of each person is definitely a part of what Paul is talking about, but Paul doesn't have each individual person in mind being built up. He has each individual person in mind for the building up of the whole. There's an action here for us to participate in. Paul stresses that the aim uh, of strengthening the whole church is, is about the whole church, not just little minority parts of it. The aim of your ministry, and if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you have a ministry. The aim of your ministry is to build up the body as a whole. The aim is that no part would be lacking because all people are plugged into the right places with their gifts, serving with their gifts. And I think, I think this helps for me anyway. This is a helpful uh, reminder for me. When we think of our gatherings as family gatherings, when we realize that we are a family, we are a household. Here. That's what we are. We're not a business. We're a household. And one of the greatest things, I was trying to think of, of something that has encouraged me about ministry in this church, and there are several things, but one of the greatest encouragements that I've had is if we go back a few years ago to the COVID lockdown, the programs in the church halted. We couldn't meet. We couldn't do anything. We had to stop meeting, but people still found ways to serve each other. Some small groups kept in touch with each other and continued to disciple each other. I remember uh, we led a, a decent group of guys through the book Expositional Preaching uh, and, and had weekly Zoom calls with them. Um, people were checking in on, on everyone else. We were doing grocery deliveries. We were doing toilet paper runs, if you could even find it at the time. The church found, the church found new and creative ways to minister to one another. There was initiative in ministry. There was a genuine, a genuine family care. And I pray that if anything good came out of the COVID lockdown whatsoever, it's that we learned the value of ministering to one another for the sake of the whole church, even when we could not be together. It was a beautiful thing, I thought. And how much better can we do as we gather regularly as family on Sunday mornings. No distance between us. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, 
He says, whenever you come together, whenever you come together, let all things be done for edification. Let all things that you are doing be done for the building up of the church. So how can we do that? How do we, how, how do we focus on edification and doing all things in the church for the building up of the church? I'm going to give you just three quick things this morning for you to personally consider. One is that we make the quest for edification, for building up explicit in our lives, make that quest clear in our lives. When, when Paul says, let all things be done for edification, he means all things. So in everything, you know, those who, who teach anywhere in the church, in teaching, in decisions that are being made on ministry teams, for those of you who serve there, in our music ministry, in our hospitality crews, you know, the, the, the people who work in the kitchen, the people who greet at the front door, um, nursery duty, ushering, all of these things, we should ask two questions. Will this edify the body, or more specifically, in what way? In what way will this build up the body of Christ? In what way will what I'm doing build up the people of the church. The second thing is to make the practice of edification personal. Make it personal. Ministry belongs to you. Ministry belongs to the people of the church. The project of building up the church is a group project, and there is nothing worse when you have a group project than when somebody's not doing their share, right? That causes problems. Each believer is gifted to do something in the church, to do something for the church. When members turn their backs to service, they're they're depriving brothers and sisters of an important work of ministry that may affect them deeply. It it may weaken those brothers and sisters, and then they begin to drop out of, uh, of service, and the cycle continues, and we don't want that. We should each consider the opportunity that God gives us to minister with our gifts a priority for the health of the church. We need to do our part in this group project of of building up the church. And the third thing is to make the model for edification faithfulness. Encourage people by your endurance in serving and doing ministry. I think sometimes we focus just a little bit too much on weaknesses uh, in the church and we address them fairly reactively. And don't get me wrong, we definitely need to strengthen and fortify those areas. But the church needs to be regularly encouraged for areas of strength and faithfulness too. We have so many, so many people in the church who who give so much of their time and their talents and their gifts faithfully to the church. And I think when we highlight the faithful service in our church, others are more apt to participate in that. Others, you know, want to be encouraged to be a part of it, or at the very least can look there to see what faithfulness looks like. So I'm saying serve and model faithfulness in your service to encourage and inspire others to do the same. Church, we can have all the right doctrine. We can believe all the right things. We can have some of the best ministry practices, some of the best ministry programs, but if the church lacks that middleware, If we lack the aim, the the knowing why we do what we do and and what we seek to accomplish in Christ, then the church misses out on the crucial truths of serving in the church. Part of our purpose, part of our purpose to gather is so that we may be equipped to serve and in turn use that equipping to do the work of the ministry in the church so that the church would be built up, so the church would grow in Christ-likeness. And in maturity, Jesus wants to come back to, to, to a, a healthy church. And Scripture again and again puts, puts the focus on each person doing their part. And if you don't have a part, let's find you a place, right? Let's, let's find a place for you to serve. We can find a spot for you anywhere, right? Let's help you understand what your gifts are and how you can serve this church and be inspired by our Lord to do the work of ministry. And I'm just going to close with a quote from one of my favorite pastors, one of my favorite authors, Paul Tripp. Paul Tripp says, Your life is much bigger than a good job, an understanding spouse, and non-delinquent kids. It is bigger than beautiful gardens, nice vacations, and fashionable clothes. In reality, you are part of something immense, something that began before you were born and will continue after you die. 
God is rescuing fallen humanity, transporting them into the kingdom, and progressively changing them into his likeness, and he wants you to be a part of that. And I just think what a truly, truly beautiful thing that God would call us to build up his church. Be encouraged and inspired by this word today. Amen, church? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for another opportunity to come together this morning and to worship you, to sing praises to you, to pray to you, to give in your name, and and Lord, to hear your word. And I pray that we would each come away from this message today being encouraged to serve in the church, that we as leaders would be encouraged to equip well the people of the church to serve and use their gifts to build up your church. Lord, we we want to be a healthy church. We want to... we, We want to please you in our faith, in our practice. And Lord, I just ask that you would would ultimately make that clear in our lives, that you would uh, just just pull our hearts to service and understand the needs in the church, the needs of, of different people in the church, and be willing to step in if it's the right place for us, step in and, and do the work of ministry. Lord, ministry belongs to your people. You have designed it this way, and it is a good design. And we ask that you would bless our efforts in such a thing. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen.